Hey everybody, it's Bob Crossan, Senior Managing Editor for Water and Waste Digest. And as we have been doing the entire rest of this year, we have been featuring our 2020 WWD top projects. So today I have with me Ryan Popko. He is Programming Manager for the Water Purification Project for JEA in Florida. And I have Greg Wetera. He is Vice President and Membrane Technology Leader for CDM Smith. And we're going to talk a little bit about the JEA Water Purification Research and Development for Potable Reuse Water Supply. So yeah, thank you both for being on the call to me and congratulations on a top project. Yeah, thank you. So let's start with you, Ryan. Um, let's get some context on here. Could you talk a little bit about JEA, who it serves, how big the system is, size, flows, all that kind of stuff. Just kind of help, help us set the stage for what this would mean for you guys. Sure. Uh, JEA is the utility provider for the greater Jacksonville, Florida area. Uh, we serve parts of four different counties, providing water, sewer, and electric service. Uh, we serve about a million people. <clears throat> and so flows on our uh, water sewer side uh, produce about 120 million gallons per day of potable water, uh, about 80 uh, gallons, uh, million gallons per day of wastewater treatment. And uh, that results in about 20 million gallons a day of reclaim water. So we have excess uh, available reclaim, which is why we were looking at potentially doing potable reuse. Gotcha. Yeah, so that, that was kind of the primary purpose of this project was the uh, exploring potable reuse for water supply. How did this idea first get brought up? What was kind of the response to it initially as well? I know that that's a big part of the potable reuse question. And why was this so critical for JEA? Sure. So uh, currently all of our drinking water uh, is provided by the aquifer. And so that's a finite resource. So as our population and economy continue to grow, we're eventually gonna have to develop some other alternative water supply besides using the aquifer. And so when we looked at what we had for options, we felt potable reuse had some advantages over some of the other options we have, like uh, surface water treatment or seawater desalination. Uh, primarily, we're already collecting this water 24 seven and producing reclaim, so we already have it available. We don't have to go out and develop infrastructure like well fields or intakes or things like that to go get other water. And the other thing is that our reclaim is already a high quality, it's nearly potable quality. So it's already a better uh, quality source to treat than having to go to some other alternative supply. Yeah, so what was kind of the response to it? Well, the, the first thing is, you know, it's, it's being done all over the world and, you know, uh, a lot of places out west. Uh, it's not as common in Florida. So we wanted to develop a strategic plan to step into this. And so first part was looking at uh, research and development pilot testing. And we wanted to look at the different options that we had available and ensure we could protect public health. And then if we could do that, then we would expand to future phases. And that's kind of where we're headed to or towards is a uh, demonstration scale facility for process optimization and educating the public. And then eventually if, if all that goes well, then it could be full scale implementation. Yeah. So you guys had tested a couple different water sources in this research and development process as well. Um, could you talk about kind of the water quality characteristics, how they affect this process, um, and uh, a little bit about the processes that you actually tested, because my understanding you tested two side by side here. Sure, um, starting off, we have uh, 11 water reclamation facilities. And so each of those have different quality. So we wanted to kind of bookend that water quality spectrum. So we chose more res residential uh, type facility. And then uh, where most of our uh, industrial customers and things like that, all the flow goes to this other facility. So we figured if we did testing at both of those and look to see which process worked best at, at either one, uh, if we were to do this at any of the other nine plants, it would fall within that water quality spectrum and we'd be able to determine which process would be work, work best there. And so that's kind of why we wanted to look at two processes and look at two plants. And uh, Greg can go in a little bit detail of uh, water quality and, you know, looking at that, trying to select equipment that could be able to treat both uh, types of water supplies. Yeah, yeah. So looking at the, the different water sources, we were a little bit more concerned about the about one of the uh, plants that had the uh, more industrial supplies. It actually had some landfill leachate going into it. And so we were concerned about that. We took water quality up front. One of the things we found out was that the like the the exotic constituents constituents emerging concern like pharmaceutical compounds things like that they were different between the two and and they were actually a little bit worse in the the municipally supplied uh, facility so that was i guess one of the lessons learned from this 
but the organics overall were quite a bit higher in the, um, I guess the larger the plants that had the industrial loads going into it. Um, and so that was one of the big challenges. We wanted to make sure that we could deal with a higher TOC or you know, organic content in that water. Um, and we knew, you know, we had our two processes and I think we had another question. I think you kind of worked them both into the same one, yeah. but you know, one of our processes is, is membrane based. It's the, you know, the full advanced treatment uh, train that they, they, they use, or as they call it in California. It's a um, microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and then UV with advanced oxidation. So that, that's tried and true for potable reuse. It's been used um, you know, overseas in Australia. They use a modified version of it in Singapore. Um, and then we've got multiple plants running in California. So we know it works and we knew it would work for either of the waters. What we didn't know is you know, one of the challenges with that is that it creates this brine stream that they have to get rid of. And, uh, and so we wanted to look at this alternative train, which was an ozone biofiltration based train. And so that's kind of modeled after what they do at Gwinnett County, Georgia. They're also doing it at the Upper, Upper Occoquan um, Service Authority in Virginia. So there's a couple plants running with that. Um, it works really well on, on clean water uh, or cleaner water. And so we wanted to make sure that, that it could work. Um, and I guess one of the takeaways from this is that they did both work. Uh, we were able to make both process trains work on uh, both of the waters. We met our, our TOC goals. We met our removal of, of emergent constituent goals. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, it turned out uh, for, for these waters that the full advanced treatment ended up being comparable cost, uh, just because the, the operating costs of the ozone biofiltration ended up getting a lot higher than we, ex uh, than we initially expected. Um, and so you got a better quality water with the RO at essentially the same cost. And so that's what we ended up recommending. Yeah. Were there other interesting nuances that you found when you were treating uh, in both or testing both of these different treatment trains? Were there things that you were like that kind of surprised you or um, maybe some small nuances, especially with the, the water quality aspect that you were talking about before? Yeah. So one of the trade-offs in the ozone biofiltration one is um, you can you can rely on either the coagulation and settling to get rid of organics or you can rely on the ozone biofiltration. And so if you do more coagulation, you don't need as much ozone and ozone is expensive. Um, so, you know, we tried to optimize as much as we could the, the coagulation. Uh, what surprised me was the amount of coagulant needed. I mean, we were looking in the hundreds of milligrams per liter to, to get this to, um, to, you know, to get the organics where we wanted so that we could minimize how much ozone was added. Uh, and so that ended up really driving the cost. And at one of the plants, it also, we were using ferric, coag uh, ferric chloride for coagulant. And so we ended up adding a lot more chlorides into the system just from that. Um, and so, you know, we were already on the high end for TDS. This made it even worse. So, you know, those were a couple things that we didn't, I, I think we didn't completely appreciate going into this until we started doing our bench tests. Yeah, yeah. Ryan, did you learn anything from the... The, these two different tests uh, that you found interesting for, for JEA? Sure, yeah, and I think that's, you know, Greg touched on it with the ozone uh, bath system and whether or not you add coagulant upstream or you have carbon polishing on the back end. Uh, I think that's, you know, more of the, um, where we would have to try and optimize things because the process doesn't remove any chloride. So if you're gonna add coagulant up, upstream, uh, you're adding TDS and chloride to the water. Uh, so that was a bit of a challenge and then operation um, you know, we had uh, dealing with the solids and how much was forming in the coagulation process, um, you know, that could be a challenge. Uh, but really, you know, I think trying to do, we tried to uh, do a lot in the short amount of time. And so doing both processes at two different plants, one after the other, uh, what really made this a success was, you know, coming up with a plan ahead of time so that we knew what we wanted to test for and why. Uh, so we could step through the treatment process and um, look upstream and then as we went down, look downstream and be able to have a sampling uh, protocol to be able to get our routine sampling, our lab sampling that we were doing, uh, try and get all our ducks in a row. Uh, and, and CDM did a great job of setting all that up and that made it a lot easier once we got into the details of the plan was already established for us. So how are you using the R&D now? Uh, have you put anything into place? Is there anything that you're working on? Yeah, so now that we have uh, selected the membrane-based train for uh, the next phases in our program, 
uh, we're getting ready to design and build a 1 million gallon per day demonstration facility. So now instead of using pilot equipment, we're stepping it up to full scale equipment. Uh, we'll be able to train our own operators on that, optimize the process, pre-qualify manufacturers and things like that so that when we go for a larger scale, uh, we're prepared, prepared to do that. And then the other component is, you know, educating the public, you know, as you mentioned earlier on, you know, that can be, you know, sometimes the bigger challenge than the technical issues with this. So um, really engaging them, showing them what we're doing, uh, you know, that it's safe and reliable and, you know, drop proof. And it has a whole bunch of benefits over other potential uh, alternative water supplies. Yeah, Greg, just touching on that on that public relations aspect. Uh, you mentioned all of like the California plants and stuff like that. How, what types of things are you pulling from their resources and their experience to help inform the way that you can approach that for JEA? Yeah, and that comes back to it, as you said, public relations. I mean, that's the, the biggest lesson learned for me um, on these California projects is how important public relations is. Um, and it's not just our experience, it's like the Australia experience as well, uh, East Coast versus West Coast of Australia. Um, you know, on the West Coast in Perth, they put a lot bigger focus on public outreach and really getting the public involved. They, they had demo facilities, um, you know, and similar to what we've done in some of our California plants, like the San Diego one we worked with, um, you build a demo plant, you bring tours in, you bring public officials in, and you really get the public on board, and it helps avoid some of the problems that have happened at facilities where, um, where they, you know, like in the, the Brisbane, Australia area, they built three plants, and they were never able to use any of them for potable reuse because the public wasn't on board at the time. Um, so, you know, I think uh, JEAs uh, uh, should be credited with this. I mean, they've seen this as being very important. Um, they, they did their, their R&D initially. They're doing a demo facility now, and they're working really hard to make sure that the public's on board before they move forward with the full-scale plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Ryan, just throwing the last question at you, what's kind of the future of potable reuse for JEA now? <laughs> where, where, what's the next step? Sure, yeah, we're, we're um, going through our long-term planning process, integrated water resources planning, 50 years out, and we envision this having uh, multiple facilities of our water uh, plants, uh, trying to maximize the use of our reclaimed water. So some of, that's already, already, uh, some of that is already going to be allocated to future growth for reclaim, where we have access available uh, to be able to implement potable reuse. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I do appreciate you guys taking the time today. It's been great to, to talk to you and get some more details on this, uh, this research and development. It's very exciting to me because I think potable reuse is a very cool topic area. So to see you guys putting so much effort behind making sure that it works for you is really, really cool. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.